tedious parts of the Form 5471. And so here with this video, I'm starting off on the IRS website. Please notice the, the URL in case you want to get to it. I'll also put it in a link in the PowerPoint. And this is the part of the website that's part of the handbook for the IRS agent. I like this because it gives um, a general explanation and it leads, to, it leads to some clues about tax planning. Of course, it's not going to give you tax planning. But when you see it telling the agent of what to look for, that's your tax planning clue. What you just want to do is to do it correctly. So when the agent looks at it, he gives you a A+. Plus. The instructions require, require encourage us to use worksheet A to figure out the subpart of income. In some cases, it's not necessary. The client may just have investments in it, uh, ETF fund or um, purely investment income, and no operating expenses other than maybe the fee to do the, the tax return or some other fees of that type. That kind of income is foreign personal holding company income, the first item up here and you can just go ahead and just have them pay tax on a full amount. In other cases, your client has a more, more of an active business, and the Schedule A is a good place for you to look at the mathematics of reducing the taxable income by some of the allowable expenses. But I want to go over the, the jargon first, because these are the items that are subpart of income for that form. It's foreign-based company income, and it also has insurance income but I want to get, get us to understand the foreign-based company income. Foreign personal holding company income is a lot like domestic personal holding company income. They actually took that domestic law and put it into the international law in 1960. It's your interest, rents, dividends, your, your strictly investment income. Foreign-based company sales income. That is income that is related party sales income of inventory. Foreign-based company service income is related party income of providing a service. I have a um, operation in Ireland, and it's doing uh, work for me here with my business here in California. I pay it the, the fee to do tax returns or accounting. That income is related party income is for and, and, and is foreign-based company service income. It can also be income that I assign to it. <clears throat> so, for example, I uh, get an engagement. It's a German company. They want some international tax planning. I pass that business opportunity on to my Irish company. That is also foreign-based company service income. For it not to be foreign-based company service income, the German client would have had to first contact the Irish company. Foreign-based company shipping income is really something we don't too often see as a small business, so I'll skip that. And same with foreign-based company oil-related income. And item two is a good note to the auditor, good note for us. It will the the subpart of income is reduced by allowable deductions. And that's what we want to work on with that Schedule A. I like this form. It does this form. This IRS website is going to go over this, this, what I told you with some more detail. But I want to get to one thing that um, is a trap for a lot of people, and that is the branch rule. So back to foreign-based company sales income. If I have um, operations in two countries, the branch rule can, or even one country, the branch rule can pretend like I sold products manufactured from one part of my company to another branch and make the sub F income apply. And I just want you to be aware of it. I want you to be aware of this simple to read instruction on the IRS website, the guidelines. Um, the exceptions here, country of consumption exception. I want you to know that they're here. Obviously, if you have a client who has this issue, you're going to get into these regulations and really drill down, and that's what's important. So 
now that we have this tool, let's go over to the form itself. And it's found on page eight of the instruction. And before we get to the form, I want to highlight something that um, is um, been a problem for the IRS <laughs> for a long time since they lost the court case on it. And it's over here on line one. And it has to do with foreign partnerships. And we're going to talk a little bit about that forum during the seminar. The IRS is, as I mentioned before, is coming out with a forum like Form 926 for foreign partnerships. The IRS believes Congress has given them the authority to tax you when you transfer appreciated property to a foreign partnership, even though the tax code says otherwise. And the IRS has never done well with partnerships. And as we all know, it's a combination of the entity theory, as a separate entity like a S Corp, or the aggregate theory, a bunch of self-employed people um, working independently under the same roof, let's say. And so the threshold that the IRS looks at is a 25% ownership. And what you're going to need a lot of work if you have a client with a foreign partnership, you have to do the partnership accounting first and then drill down to see if there's a transaction that would fall under all the rules I just explained to you if the um, person was a, if, if the partnership didn't exist, if you were dealing directly with the related shareholder. And it's important to point this out to your client because when you get such a, a, a engagement, it's going to be a big fee. And this is where we have conflicts with the clients. They go international, they don't call us in advance, uh, and then they're shocked at the fee. It's kind of like the, the man who buys a Ferrari and he goes in for his first tune-up and he's shocked at the cost. If you have a high-performing tax structure, it's really expensive to keep that, that thing tuned up. And that's what I, that's what I tell my clients. So the Schedule A and Worksheet A is really, the first part is very um, straightforward. Um, this is form-based company sales income. All these items on lines three and four is gross income. Of his income, less direct cost of sales. Service income is usually just the great gross service fee. Gross, once again, gross insurance income. So they gross everything up, and then you do the allocation of your expenses. And this is where the tax planning takes place. The de minimis rule is if your total subpart F income, the, these items up here, is less than 5%, you, in effect, ignore everything as subpart F and you're just fine. If it's between 5% and 7%, you just pay tax on the subpart F. If it's more than 7%, generally all the income is going to, be, is going to pass through to the shareholder. This next part here is the expense is where we put in the expenses directly related, um, related person into the expense. It's here. No, it's a warning for you, but you can do a lot with it if you understand the rule. Same with the, the net foreign based company sales income, the service income. They all have, this is an important, the net high tax exception. If you're in a high tax country, it actually has a rate close to the corporate rate in the United States. Um, the income is going to be excluded from subpart F. So part of the planning is sometimes put that subpart F income into a high tax country if it works out with the business plan. Keep in mind, business planning comes first, the tax planning follows afterwards. I want to get down to an important line, two important lines. One is bribes, kickbacks. As we're dealing now with a lot of countries where bribes is where bribes are common now throughout Asia, Vietnam, China, even in parts of Latin America. Calling the bribe a consulting fee, a speaker fee, a management fee, it's still a bribe. And the risk is that you have filed a false tax return by putting the um, bribe in at some other expense. And that will get you either in jail or so can get you to spend a lot of time with Ken Burrish. Hopefully, Ken is your first choice. 
sell by death income before section 952. We'll get to that in a second. And this is one of the big, in, in 959, and this is one of the big exceptions here. If the income is from a, a U.S. business, it's not self-part F income. You should track it out. And, and you are going to report it on your Form 1120F, but you do not pay tax on it. Section, 9, section 959B has to do with um, prior self-part F income. But the big thing I want you to look at is line 29, current e and P. If it is zero or less, but the, the in theory it can't go below zero, you have no no tax that year coming through a self-part F. So line 30, smaller, of line 28 or 29. It's just that plain. So tax planning looks at each corporation and um, getting certain corporations to not have earnings and profits other corporations do, maybe in a higher tax jurisdiction, and it is part of the Google type of tax planning or Apple type of tax planning where it is really sophisticated. And the client who saves taxes that way is the one who understands he's, he is asking you to build that Ferrari, and you're building it by hand. There's no custom plate. This is not a, 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 a Ford off the a, assembly line. This is a handmade um, tax plan. And remember, only the provided share of this is self-part F income. So it's not all of it. And then sometimes what clients do, they'll put the voting stock, because that's where you get the self-part F income. They'll put it in a tax exempt entity, a private foundation, certain types of self-directed retirement plans. There's a variety of tools. Sometimes the client's just looking to save um, state income tax, who put it in a, in a non-grantor trust in a state like Nevada, maybe get some asset protection or some estate tax planning. So I'm going to finish up this video. I'm going to go back to the lecture. We're going to open it up for, so for some questions and answers, because we're just about through with Form 5471, and I want to get on to the uh, Form 1120F, because it ties into this form after we have a short break from this topic.